Just a hundred years ago, milk was delivered to British doorstops in uncapped bottles. Today, it's hard to imagine this, but back then it was a common practice. Perhaps this could go on like that if not for all kinds of sanitary standards and birds. Two species of British garden birds, blue tits and robins, have learned to siphon up the cream straight through the bottlenecks. Well, I gotta say, milk causes diarrhea in birds, thanks to lactose that their bodies can't digest. But the cream on top of the milk has little lactose. It's also quite nutritious. So it's actually clear why the birds started stealing it. To cope with a new diet, the digestive systems of these two species have undergone adaptation. This happened quite quickly, especially on the evolutionary time scale. After the Second World War, they started sealing bottles with foil caps so that the milk would stay fresh longer. But by the 50s, blue tits had learned to pierce these caps and continue to siphon up cream. Moreover, they passed this knowledge on to each other, although the robins failed to learn the trick. This type of stealing almost died out when skimmed milk became available, and doorstep delivery was no longer relevant. Well, until the birds came up with other strategies. British tits are pretty damn good when it comes to adaptation. Researchers scanned the DNA of more than 3,000 British and Dutch great tits and found that British birds have a gene that makes their beaks longer. To be sure, scientists looked at the historical records and discovered that, over time, the beaks of great tits really became longer. This seems to be caused by the spread of bird feeders. To get more food out of them, the birds needed a long beak. While British tits have given up on stealing cream, their relatives from Sapmi, Finland, are doing insane things. The Finnish tits fly into cow sheds and peck cows in the udder, after which they die from a blood infection. I'm not kidding, that's real news from 2020. Vets believe that birds don't really mean to seriously harm the cows. Most likely, tits are attracted to milk fat on the udder. They peck it, accidentally injuring the cows. The wound begins to fester. Often, the animal simply can't survive this. Moreover, this happened on at least three farms, and the damage to the farmers amounted to about 35,000 euros. To protect the animals, they set up nets in the cow sheds wherever tits could get through. But it still didn't help. The birds somehow got inside anyway. Keep in mind, the British blue tits once learned to open the caps on milk bottles because they shared their knowledge with each other. Seems like the same thing is happening in Sapmi. Tits share their intel with each other, and some get into the shed anyway. And then farmers lose tens of thousands of euros. In fact, tits are much smarter than you might think. For example, in Japan, they use icicles as a water source when everything else freezes. Tits gather around the icicle, wait for the sun to melt it a little, and then nibble the drops from the tip. They even form a line. While tits drink milk and water from icicles, woodpeckers have learned to come together to create food banks. I'm talking about acorn woodpeckers. They are really dependent on acorns, so when winter's close, these birds start to stock up on them. Acorn woodpeckers live in groups of up to 15 birds, and together they collect acorns, which are stored in something made of wood. Usually, these are driftwood, dry branches, poles, or wooden buildings, and they may have several thousand holes, each with an acorn in it. Birds use both natural holes and the ones they've made. In one case, people found over 440 pounds of acorns in a wooden water tank in Arizona. But simply collecting all the acorns isn't enough. The acorn bank requires constant maintenance. First, the woodpeckers need to drive away other animals who love acorns, and second, to swap acorns. Over time, they dry out and shrink, so they're moved to smaller holes and the vacated ones are filled with new stock. This is required, otherwise the dried out acorns may simply fall out. It's believed that the acorn woodpecker is the only bird that has a centralized food storage, which is also defended communally. How about donkey nannies? It's even better than acorn banks. Donkey nannies are used by Italian shepherds to carry newborn lambs from the high pastures to the plains. The lambs are still too small to make such a journey on their own. The donkeys have to wear something like a special coat with pockets to fit baby lambs inside. Some coats have up to six pockets and the lambs travel with their heads out, watching what's going on around them. Donkeys are also used to carry small llamas and alpacas. Donkeys are actually quite patient animals, which makes them perfect nannies. But while the donkeys act as lamb carriers, a Springer Spaniel named Jess goes out on a dairy farm three times a day in any weather to feed orphan lambs from a bottle that she carries in her mouth. Jess was trained to feed lambs when she was a puppy. Since then, for about 10 years, 
she's been helping her owner. Overall, Nanny Jess has an impressive resume and great references. Forster's terns could definitely use a nanny. These birds often make their nests in shallow water or a lowland, and if there's heavy rain, yes, you guessed it, it floods everything. For birds, especially small species, rain can be lethal. Their feathers get wet, the bird becomes cold, gets sick, and dies. But terns aren't that small, or maybe they're just incredibly tenacious. Seriously, just look at it. Sitting all alone, feathers ruffled. This creates air pockets between the feathers that allow the birds to retain heat. Some birds can regulate their metabolism and thus compensate for heat loss. Though I honestly have no idea how condors keep their cool, these guys must have nerves of steel. When Chile experienced a sudden volcanic eruption in 2011, the local Andean condors didn't even try to fly to another place. They also weren't too happy about the death of livestock, which actually meant more carrion for them. The condors just ignored what was going on. I repeat, they ignored the volcanic eruption. The one that affected aircraft flights all around the world and caused serious damage to local farmers, the condors simply didn't care. Are they somehow related to honey badgers or what? The condors continued to fly their usual course through the ash plumes and feed in the same place as always, although the dead prey was scattered literally everywhere. Do scientists understand this behavior? Nope. Of course they have theories. Some believe that it's more important for condors to stay in familiar territory than to dodge dangerous ash. Others believe that ash actually doesn't bother condors much. I don't know how this is possible. Maybe they grew up in Mordor or something? Seems like we're too focused on animals. Don't get me wrong, I love them. But have you ever thought that delivering cars to cold regions can be extremely cool? Like, literally? In December 2021, the cargo ship Sun Rio Roro arrived in the Russian city of Vladivostok, covered with a thick crust of ice. Ice also covered the cargo, which in that case meant cars from Japan. As a result, they all looked like a giant ice cream. And some of the cars were covered with a 6-inch layer of ice. The explanation is quite simple. Minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit and strong waves that hit the deck of the ship. I wonder how they melted all that ice then. And yes, there was supposed to be some kind of transition, but it seems like Steve skipped a page in the script. So just check out this tree. There are more than 15 such trees and you can find them throughout the United States. Perhaps they will seem quite ordinary to you, but only until they blossom, and then it'll become clear why they are called Trees of Forty Fruit. The trees were created by Syracuse University professor Sam Van Aken. He grafted various fruit trees to the base. In total, he had 250 varieties at his disposal, but of course not all of them took root. Today you can find almonds, cherries, apricots, plums, peaches, and nectarines on the Tree of Forty Fruits. And that's not even a full list. While plants are more or less clear, what about animals that combine seemingly incompatible properties? Especially when it comes to having entire body parts made of male and female cells in one organism. No, I'm not talking about hermaphrodites now. This anomaly is called gynandromorphism. That is, having a male right part and a female left part. Or front and back parts of a different gender. The male and female tissues could also be randomly mixed, as if someone took two different puzzles and mixed them. Tracking the anomaly is not always possible. If sexual dimorphism, that is the differences between male and female individuals, is less pronounced, it's almost impossible to notice that something is wrong. This happens due to the incorrect distribution of sex chromosomes among the cells during the maturation of the egg, fertilization or splitting. In short, at some point, the chromosomes get mixed, and everything goes not like it was supposed to. Gynandromorphs are found among insects, spiders, crustaceans, and other arthropods. In extremely rare cases, you can find birds with this condition. In February 2021, an amateur ornithologist in Pennsylvania snapped a picture of a northern cardinal that displayed signs of both a female and a male. In this case, everything was clear. The males of this species are red and the females are pale brown, so it's hard to make a wrong assumption here. By the way, according to National Geographic, in 2019 a couple noticed a similar bird in the same area. 
That was also a bicolor cardinal, so it might have been the same guy. Or girl? But that's where a question came to my mind. If nature sometimes creates such animals, can they pass on their peculiar genes? I mean, will their offspring also be half male, half female? Well, it's believed that most gynandromorphs are infertile, at least based on the data that scientists have, but this particular cardinal may well leave offspring. The thing is, the left side of his body is female, and in birds, only the left ovary is the functioning one. So, good luck to him. Well, or her. And here's another fact that surprised me, although it has nothing to do with the previous ones. Dirt doesn't stick to scars. Have you ever noticed it? Anyway, there's a logical explanation behind this phenomenon. And here's how it works. A scar is a patch of fibrous tissue that replaces normal skin after an injury. The tissue is made up of collagen, like, for example, our tendons and ligaments. Fibrous tissue stretches well, but does not contain sweat glands like normal skin. Well, where would they come from? This means that the scarred area doesn't sweat, and thanks to this, dirt and dust don't stick to it. It simply has nothing to stick to. Unless, of course, the scar gets wet. See you later.